Coming up on today's episode, SpaceX launches people into space along with baby Yoda, the Tesla updates the Model Y, and the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico. Not doing so hot. Let's get ludicrous. Welcome to Our Ludicrous Future. This is the podcast where we talk about all the cool future stuff that's happening today. It's going to make tomorrow totally ludicrous. I'm Joe Scott with the Answers of Joe YouTube channel. With me is the one, the only, no, the incomparable, no. Oh. the sexy. I don't know what incomparable means, but that's definitely what I am. Incomparable. You are without compers. Without compromise, me. Tim Dodd, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Tim Dodd, the uncompromised. There. I Ooh. what? No. I, <laughs> I don't know. I've uh, seen some videos of yours. I know. And with us as always is uh Ben Solens. Hey saying? guys, it's Ben Solens, the internet Solens. person that you may have seen or you know, angrily commented at before, which is like <laughs> what people do. I just love that. I love that I give people a reason to vent their frustrations. It's like better we need better it. like leave it's an like angry a- comment on my video than like you know, be angry at your You're family a public servant. So, You're a public basically, servant. Basically, I'm like the Mother Teresa of YouTube is what's happening. That's what's You're going on. You're a public on. punching bag. Yeah. That's, Thank you. You know, they always said I've got a face that just makes me want to punch things. So <laughs> here no, you I, are. I, you're welcome. I know you're, I know you're having a bad week when I get a, a text from Ben and he's like, do you ever just want to delete all your social media accounts? <laughs> <laughs> and this happens about once every Every week. What? Yeah, pretty much <laughs> once a week. Yeah. Every week you look at you click it, you go, What? What is I get why that text, I'm here? like, Oh, it's Wednesday at night. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Ben well, posted a video this week, I see. Got it. Got yep. it. Yep. Yep. And with us as always, people that <laughs> that are Good allowed people. to do the punching. If you want to be punching us in real time, not just hmm. posthumously. Later. Yeah. Is that was posthumous? I mean, I think so. That's fact. a great word, though. Then uh, you can you can listen today. and join live on uh, on Discord, and you can do so by learning more and signing up, joining the family at olfpod.com slash Patreon. That's yeah, where all the cool punch cats us, you and kittens pay for are. it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Each punch is is five That's, cents. <laughs> we just line up, and people just. <laughs> Ooh. Yep. Yep. Five pounds. I think it is. Is that how? Hey, speaking of punches to the face. Ooh. Ooh. Can I start off this week with something that I'm really excited about? There is a company Can that is going to punch face? every rocket company in the face, make every rocket we've ever seen completely obsolete. Yes, of course, I'm talking about Arca Bigly. and their eco rocket that apparently is uh, old technology now, spaceship, super heavy. Or uh, it's, uh, By the way, they call it spaceship, not starship. Spaceship oh. slash Super Heavy, New Glenn, and oh. Falcon 9 <laughs> are all old. That's old stuff. Old technology. Arca's Ooh. future heavy rocket, though. This New is technology. The one. New Got technology. It. Oh, an really? electron. See? You know, you know the, 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 the electron rocket that uses 3D printed engines and carbon composite, you know, lithium ion. But then what are the newest, most high tech rockets ever made? Yeah, that's now old design and old technology. So this keep green that in screen mind. is not actually very good. I don't know what they're doing. No, it's not a it's not a green screen. It was an actual projector. So anyway, so you're this wearing is all black with black background. Is that yeah. for real? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also a guy that came out with a, a pea coat that was also wearing Whoa. a pea coat. Well, it's Inspector Gadget. <laughs> yes. So Go um, Go Gadget Rocket. <laughs> so Arca this week, who has been a space company about as long as SpaceX, um, literally been around for I think over a decade now. Um Guys, so I don't want to talk bad about anybody. It's just not in my nature. But this company has just, I think this is the biggest, at this point, I don't know if it can be anything other than really a a scam. It's like the Nikola of rockets. I was about to say. Yes. Is that they they buy their design here? on fire. Actually, you don't even need a, to buy a design. You could just like draw this on like. SketchUp or something. So basically, the first stage of this rocket is intended to be a. It's a literally a giant, uh, water, steam rocket. Oh. So that the part Mad of Mike. The, what was that? Mad Mike. We saw how that went. Yeah, we've seen, we've seen that. Oh yeah. If it is literally to steam powered, and I mean that's uh, it's not the worst idea, but the problem is is steam offers like a 
quarter or a fifth the like specific impulse of any other rocket fuel so it's terrible so it's it takes you know you'd have to have five times as much of it to perform the same amount of work which of course means five times the weight which means you'd perform less work etc cetera, etc cetera. you know so that's the problem with the rocket equations you cannot get to orbit like just physically with something that inefficient but it is a two-stage rocket the upper stage is going to be a more traditional kerosene rocket apparently uh, or you know Keralox based but they claim that because it's just purely uh, water vapor, that it's going to be extremely green. They're trying to use an aerospike engine. Uh, and they claim that it's going to be able to land right vertical takeoff and landing for the first stage. But uh, if they have those mm. fins down there at the what will eventually be the front of the rocket as it's coming back down for its landing, they are not going to do that. That thing's going to whip around backwards in a second. Um, but this is just simply, uh, I gotta say, it's just, it's just, I just don't believe it. Was this <laughs> just like at a soundstage in LA? Like where did they film this? No, this is in, um, what company, what, what country are these guys from? I, I don't remember. Yeah, they got a European Union flag there. Yeah, they're from, they're from like, I don't remember Blue, what country. yellow, orange? Uh, Romania, Romania, thank you. Yeah, it's Romania. Huh. Um, and I mean, these guys have done some cool, like they had been working on an aerospike forever. I mean, this is like their whole thing is, and you guys know, I think aerospikes are awesome. Um, but it slowly just keeps diluting from like a, you know, at one point, look at nine years ago, they've been working on on stuff. And all these are always kind of these like harebrained schemes, like, hey, we're going to take a, a balloon and, you know, launch something from a balloon. Oh no, okay, that didn't quite work. Now we're going to make <laughs> a thruster. Okay, okay, that didn't quite work. It just seems like they're constantly doing, you know, like harebrained schemes. And so so basically this is the why don't they just channel that we were talking about yes. <laughs> yeah like this it was like a hoverboard thing that they made that they raised millions of dollars and then you know came out that like it was a scam basically where's uh captain disillusion for all seriously this? <laughs> you know that's great yeah captain disillusion would probably love to have i mean it might have flown for like eight seconds or something but well i didn't audi do this uh Hold on, Audi hoverboard. Yeah, but they did one that was yeah. like on. Oh, Lexus, Lexus did. Lexus, it. like it's like, uh, but cryogenically cooled, like magnets and stuff or whatever. Like, uh huh. Uh, on thing. on like a skate park that also <laughs> had magnets or whatever. Right? Yeah, like the whole thing. <laughs> like yeah, it technically worked, but like it was just kind of a. I mean, it was like a World's Fair kind of a thing, right? Like yep. we just, this is a very bespoke, yeah, one off. Like, when thing you're standing that... on magnets with the magnet, guess what? You can hover. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, yeah. Earth is a giant magnet, guys. I thought you knew. <laughs> so <laughs> basically, this just keeps getting more and more diluted to the point where it's a steam rocket now. Um, as a matter of fact, Scott Manley last year did a basically de kind of debunked it in a sense, saying, like, look, the amount of energy they can get from this is laughably low. And that's kind of what oh, I'm wait, at. It looks like they responded to him there. They Go did down respond a bit. to him. Ooh. Yeah. yeah, right there. Yeah. So, I mean, it's. It's this whole thing. Showed I, I, him. I don't really want to ever poo-poo on a company, but I just based on the numbers, like, you, you, I don't... So, here's... Come on, the end of the this day, is YouTube. Do it. At the, at Do the it. end of the day, they're trying to launch 10 kilograms, which is fine because there's a market for 10 kilogram, you know, those you could launch a couple CubeSats or something or a CubeSat or two for a million dollars, basically, is what they're saying. And they're saying this will be cheaper than Starship. Starship launches over a hundred thousand kilograms for that same price, for a million so dollars. For a million dollars, that's the intent. Wait, wait, wait. I can launch a hundred thousand kilograms to space for a million dollars. When Starship's fully operational, that's the plan. I'm not I buying my Rivian. I a million dollars away. I'm not buying my <laughs> Rivian anymore. That's it. I'm saving my money. <laughs> But so if by that method, because they even show it on screen, they go like, you know, this is this is cheaper than Starship. And they show Starship's prices like a thousand or a million dollars, whatever. And then theirs is like 950 or something. I don't remember. It's ridiculous. I'm like, <laughs> $10 yeah, cheaper. you're taking 10 kilograms of space. Of course it's cheaper. They're taking a thousand times that amount to space. So like <laughs> at best, you're three orders of magnitude worse dollar per kilogram than they are. Like that's not revolutionary. <laughs> It's like the GM battery thing. Like it, it can go further than a Tesla. You're like, but you have double the battery, right? <laughs> of course, right? <laughs> of course you can. If you couldn't, yeah. that'd be really bad. Oh, so they're saying three hundred ninety thousand dollars per launch, a million for development. Thank you, Flo. Uh, yeah, I mean, but still, regardless, you know, yeah, that's cheaper. 
but it's still, you know, maybe a third as cheap as what Starship will be and one one thousandth the payload capacity. Um, so I just don't, I just don't but see that. Will it even the needle. work? I don't know. They don't, like, Where, they where's don't have Thunderface a working prototype when you need yet, it? Right? They don't have a working prototype. The, he said on December they're going to, they're la- launching the, the booster part. And then he said March 1st they'll be doing like a suborbital. They they have all these dates that he said like March 1st, April 1st, June, basically getting into orbit by next year. If they get to orbit by next year, I will pull a Peter Beck. If they put something into orbit next year, I will eat my hat. Did he do that? He might be this week. I if mean, he, is there Today. like an eco hat company that makes Wait, what, things yeah, that are what, edible? <laughs> like it sounds dangerous. It's made out of fruit by the foot. So, so what is uh, what was Peter's thing? If the they, hat eating thing, he said he'll never uh, do a reusable rocket. Oh, okay, okay. And so he said he had to eat his own hat when they came out and said that they're going to try and re- do reusability. It's we, like the you know Chiquita what? We banana do that. hat. We should, uh, we should, we should like get a, a hat cake. Sent to him a hat shaped yes. cake. I think he's no I mean, for real though. We, no, we should do that. But I think he's actually like literally said if if we recover this one, I will literally blend up a hat and eat it. <laughs> oh, he actually no, said come that. Come on, man. don't don't do that to yourself. I mean, I think if you blend it up enough and just have a little bit of it in something else, no, you won't it's just extra no. fiber. I mean, at least that's better than what <laughs> McCaffrey said he would eat. I, I'm not willing to risk Peter Beck's health. <laughs> that's for, true for that for that uh, bet. That's Don't true. eat your hat, people. I know it's He's Thanksgiving <laughs> coming, but for those of you in the states, but but again, just to just to reiterate, I, I'm not trying to poo-poo anyone's work, but this just has so many fallacies and things in it that are just like no, it has like, Nickelodeon no written all over it. it. It well, so what was the point of that uh, announcement? Just I mean, oh, the I, point I guess is, they're raising oh, money. If they're the, raising money, then yeah, it does have the stink of Nickelodeon. They're constantly <laughs> raising money, and this one especially because they're trying to win a ten million euro prize, and they're saying mm-hmm. their development is only one million. So therefore, they're looking to just tenfold their money. So it's well, almost like an X prize, yeah, or something, something like so, that. So, w- one question though: yeah. uh, it's a steam a rocket engine right kind of like a steam train or something and with that that will put water vapor into the atmosphere yeah but very low atmosphere this thing only goes like okay eight kilometers so that'll or fall something. down quickly yeah it would Got stay it. It because would actually... joe you did a video on this right and and i think water vapor is actually the problem right or that's like in terms of like ozone and stuff like water vapor oh, is um... one of the things that actually is the worst or whatever O three, 3 it was. Water, water vapor actually does uh, hold more energy than CO2, yep. but water vapor right. condenses and falls as rain. So the, it, it's, mm. it's self-regulating, whereas CO2 kind of, um, if I remember this correctly, mm-hmm. like it, its big problem is that it actually heats up the water um, mm, because of it. it's because kind of, of like physics. it's kind of like water is the the method of which can w- hold warming and do the heating. Right. But the thermostat yeah. is the CO2. Yeah, like mm. that's kind of the way I was explained to it. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. More CO2 equals. Yeah, because water vapor is not harmless either. I guess is my point. Right. If we just dumped a whole, especially in the upper atmosphere where it might have a, it might last longer and linger for more amount of time, then yeah, it can actually be pretty bad. But mm. anyway, we'll see. Again, mark my words. If in 2021, I'll give them the whole year, not one year from now, but a whole year, so they get an extra month. If they get to orbit in 2021. I will eat a hat. Yep. Mm. Well, speaking yep. of 2021, oh. Tesla is actually updating the Model Y to match the 2021 Model 3. Ooh. Oh, I have to share my own screen now. Let this me. Yeah. Haha. I'm going. I'm going back. I don't like this. Isn't it uh, funny though that they like? I mean, how many did they even make before they decided to refresh right. this? <laughs> I, so I, I, along with many others now, have a classic Model Y, I guess you could call it. <laughs> uh, Vintage. Yeah. You know, I, I, I really do want to do a video just breaking down all the changes. I don't know if I could do all the cars, but like, let's just pick Model S, you know, the oldest one. Like show every update that's happened since launch or something like that. It'd right. be a, it'd be another it'd be a Tim Dodd hour long deep dive. Oh I'm yeah, sure. do it, baby. 
if you uh, but this is the kind of thing that Tesla does all the time. Now, now the, the one weird thing, and before we get into actual details of this, the one weird thing about this is that we're calling it the 2021 Model 3, which is the first time we've ever really used a year associated right. with uh, a Tesla as being something different. Because previous to that, now, when you register your car, you do have to put the year it was produced, but... If you're, you know, longtime Tesla owner or you know follower, you know that the year means generally nothing. <laughs> uh, but here it appears to. Here it appears to be a thing. And so, the Model Y now, uh, apparently newer ones are getting the same refreshed bits as the Model Three recently got. If you guys haven't seen <laughs> that, there's lots of videos out there on that. Uh, one of them or a couple of them are kind of cool. The self dimming side mirrors, which I really didn't even know were a thing. That's kind of neat. My Model Three has it. It has self-dimming side mirrors? Yeah. What do you oh, mean by cool. that? I think they took them away. They had them and then took them away, and then now they're back. See, there you go. Yeah, so like if there's a bright <laughs> light in here, it dims it somehow, I guess? I'm not quite sure. Yep. Don't so at night, happening. you know, at night when your eyes are already, you know, dilated and used to driving at night, when a mm. car comes up behind you and is shining up bright headlights, you know, it dims that so you're not going blind. I usually just slam on my brakes and that ends it. <laughs> um. <laughs> Not that I'm that recommending thing? to do that. Then you have here a, a USB stick, kind of a funny design, um, what? and this goes in the glove box oh, that's for glove box, okay. your Sentry mode footage, <laughs> which cool. That's much better because you know right now Sentry mode footage, dash cam stuff, it can. If someone were to break into your car, they could just pull it out. Typically of the right. of where the USB is, uh, but the only beef I have with this is like, why don't you just build this in? Like literally, just put a, like a sixty-four bit chip is not bigger than your thumbnail, and you could just you know put it inside of the car. Like well, not even. How give would me. you pull the footage from it? Hey, okay, give me there a way to download it there, but like the stick itself is like unnecessary, you know. And you don't need to download the footage anymore. There's a viewer built in. Yeah, that's true. But you if know. you need to like send it to the police or something, sure, insurance. fine. There yeah. needs to be a way to export it. I I agree with that, but. I don't know. I look at this. I guess there's expandability. There may be reasons why to do this, but I'm looking at it like it should have a built-in terabyte, really. Like there's right. no reason to not throw that in. I mean, you can get uh, a USB drive, a uh, SSD terabyte for a couple hundred bucks nowadays. Uh, anyways, so now, but it will be in the glove box, which is cool. Uh, it has these silver little scroll wheels here, which I've never, mm -hmm. I haven't seen or touched personally, so I don't know if that, you know, how they feel differently. It looks a little bit wider than the, the other one. Um, this is one of the gripes I had with the Model 3 when it first came out, was I really didn't enjoy that over the Model S and X ones, which were just a bit easier to work with, but again, you know, confirmation bias and all that stuff, so. <laughs> um, and then I think, this is just a shot of it, this is the Fremont factory. I've been, man, it feels like forever since I've been there. And I feel like I was going there like every few months for a while, you know, delivering couches and stuff. <laughs> Couch delivery service. Wait, so does the interior have that new, um, like, it, the little console? Yeah, the console thing. Oh, yeah, they did. They didn't show that here. Um, yeah, it doesn't sound like that. Okay, laminated window glass. Didn't have the new center console. It, was, it didn't have that. Does it say that here somewhere? Yeah, right next level, right there. Yeah, interesting. Oh yeah, right there. Weird. Yeah, and and I'm I'm happy about that. I like the center console as it is. I I, I kind of I mean I haven't seen yeah. the other one in person, but the stuff I've seen of it, I'm not not really a fan of. So if you're familiar, if you're not familiar, the the new center console, the Model Three is is different. It looks more Model S and X like. I guess is a good way to describe mm -hmm. it. Um, I like I something I, I maybe is unpopular opinion. I really love the the thing that closes above the yeah. phones because for me, I will I will check my phone if I don't have a way to physically. You know, if I put a barrier between me and my phone, I'm in a much better place than yeah. I am if I don't have that. Um, yeah. While so, you're driving. While I'm driving. Yeah. 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 So for life, me, I, I really enjoy that. I, I, would, I think it'd be cool if you could like literally lock it to where like have a setting where like it cannot be opened while driving, you know? Yeah. That'd be crazy. I, yeah. I, I so wonder, remember, did you guys notice that like last week or two weeks ago, it was official that the battery pack in the Model 3 is technically now like 82 kilowatts mm. and not 75 because of that, in, you know, the new Panasonic cells or whatever. They're actually more dense, so therefore they actually have higher capacity. Hmm. Cool. And I wonder if the Model Y has actually always had that because, it, you know, since it boasted similar range as the 3, and now the 3 got this new pack self-structure and, you know, now the 3's like 
way better, like up to 350 miles or whatever. You know, it's kind of makes me wonder, you know. Well, but the the three also got the heat pump, right? The heat pump, yeah. Yeah. But that Which makes me wonder, s- if, wonder if, uh, the you know, the Ys always had the same battery pack too, or if we're going to see all of a sudden an update to the Y, you know, if the Y went from 75 to 82, you'd expect some, you know, 340 or something out of it now. Yeah. I would I like know. them just to drop the price to keep doing that. I think that's, I guess, from my side, from my where I sit, that's the thing that I want more of are cheaper, yeah. good EVs. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and and uh, I'm all for the fancy luxury stuff, but yeah, like let's make them more ubiquitous. Mm-hmm. Um, and and yeah, you know, we, there's we've a lot shown of stuff. that we can make fancy ones. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Like like I think it's been proven, although. It's officially been three years since the Roadster was unveiled, and it's not even a glimmer in anyone's eye anymore. So who knows if that'll ever get made? You know, maybe by I'm guessing 2025 it will be when we see at actual Roadster being made. Yeah, there's not been like any news at all on that, right? All all the news has been negative. All the news has been uh, every time someone asks Elon about it, he's like, "Oh yeah, once we get that thing done." And whatever the thing is, is like the next thing, the thing they most recently announced. Oh. So last I so recall- So they kind of keep pushing it back because, like, because they want the newest best thing in it, but they're always putting a new best thing well, out. Well, I just think it also is like overall resources of the company. Like <clears throat> it's not a huge priority for the yeah. company to be successful. Uh, so there's not like a fire burning anywhere that's like, we have to, we have to make this. Um, even though there are people that literally gave them $250,000 cash. I don't mean a deposit. I mean, mm-hmm. for the Founder Series, you had to put in that night a $5,000 deposit. Then you had to wire them the additional $245,000 cash within 10 days. Wiring mm-hmm. cash. I'm not talking financing approval, blah, blah, blah. Like serious money that is no longer yours because of it. Three years ago. <laughs> yeah. That was a lot. It's a long time of interest That's there on that. Crazy. So, anyways, um, the last I heard about it, Elon was saying that, and I think this was the Kara Swisher interview. Uh, they're gonna they have to finish the Model Y expansion in Shanghai. They have to finish Giga Berlin. They have to finish uh, the Terra factory in Texas. They have to start producing the semi. They have to start producing the Cybertruck. They basically have to do every single thing on their list of products. This is like absolutely dead last, not even a glimmer, not even like a glimmer of hope within the next two to three years, it looks like. Hmm. Yeah. So so we'll see. I, I, I still, I, I hope, I, I, don't, I don't actually expect to ever get one now. Like I, my expectations are I'll never see one. Um, <laughs> But if I do, I still hold that I hope it's by the time I'm ready for my midlife crisis. That's when I'm really hoping to have it because that would be perfect, you know. Top I think down, it'll line up pretty well. driving on the California coast, you know, wearing like polyester things with gold chains, whatever cool. the kids do in, in that time. <laughs> what are the kids? I mean, this, just, this is coming up for you in like two months, I feel like. I mean, I know. Yeah. Just, just yeeting up the coast. See, <laughs> using words like yeet. I don't even know what that means. Oh, speaking that of eating things, fantastic. Speaking of <laughs> eating things up the coast, mm. um, SpaceX yeeted a couple people up the coast of Florida, all the way up the east coast of the United States, and sent them to the International Space Station. Woo-hoo. This, ladies and gentlemen, was huge. This was a massive, massive success. This was, of course, if you don't, if you were sleeping or doing something this weekend, I don't know. Here, let's start at the very beginning of this because it shows everybody. Um, so this um, so this weekend on Sunday, SpaceX launched, had their first operational crew mission. So, of course, they had Demo 2 earlier this year that you guys remember with Bob and Doug. That was the a demonstration mission that was still a test mission. This one was operational, is operational. There we go. We have now uh, officially gone into operation with the Crew Dragon capsule. This had Commander Mike Hopkins... It had Vic Glover, uh, who is the pilot. So, of course, commander and pilot is kind of like really pilot and co-pilot, technically. Uh, there's another astronaut, Shannon Walker, and a JAXA astronaut, Soichi Noguchi. Uh, his third space flight, by the way, and he's ridden on three vehicles. He's ridden on the space shuttle, oh, wow. Soyuz, and now Crew Dragon. So he's one of only, I think, three astronauts ever to fly on three different vehicles. Wow. Isn't that cool? That's, that's super interesting. I didn't know Yeah. That. Yeah, I mean that's that's a small bit of people. No, two. Wait, he's third. First was John Young and and Wally Shira. 
There we go. Yep. He was the third astronaut ever to fly on, on three vehicles. Crazy. Was, was Shira on a space shuttle? Um, yeah, actually, how did Wally Shira? I think he did. I think he did do one on a space shuttle later on. Did he? When did Sorry, hey, what I didn't was mean to derail. I was just... Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo for Young. Yeah, but what about yeah. Shira? Did Shira? Shira didn't... Well, no, John Young was the first uh, space shuttle mission. Him and yep. uh, Crippen. No, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, Shira was also Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. Oh, I didn't realize. Yeah. Sweet. Okay. Oh, Wally got there before John. Okay, sorry, we're all. Like... <laughs> oh, because of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. Yes, and 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 John Young was Gemini, Apollo, space shuttle. In space shuttle, yeah, yeah. There yeah. we go. Okay, there. Sorry. So anyway, <laughs> but, but so there's those two, and then and then Noguchi. and now, yeah, exactly. So, uh, so well, Gucci, good for him. That's awesome. Or, I always for I was I my oh, yeah. So so Soichi Noguchi. There we go. Yeah. Um, pretty amazing. So. Yeah, so this was, of course, uh, taking four people up to the International Space Station on a Crew Dragon capsule and a brand new booster, 1061.1. Uh, so it was the first flight of this particular booster. Um, this booster is intended to refly again now with Crew 2 uh, when that happens, hopefully, in about six months. And this is kind of now regular rotation of sending humans to the International Space Station with commercial providers, which is amazing. Yeah. So... Yeah, and of course, this time, you know, these people, they will be up there for six months with um, uh, Expedition 63 and slash 64. Is that correct? Or is it 64 slash 65? I already am, even though I just did this the other day. I feel, I, I feel like the 63 just came back and 64 uh, was the three that were still up there. So this it, is 64, 65. I it's believe. 63, 64. I am Thank wrong. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> I know. I, I can't keep track of this for some reason. But yeah, uh, it was an absolutely flawless mission except for one little there's actually two little hiccups now that we're seeing today as of today uh but the first off once it got into orbit there is a little issue with the heaters um the heat pumps basically um oh it's 64 wait Flo, Flo are you right is it 64 65 looks like you were right joe answers, damn right answers with joe answers with joe <laughs> uh wild speculation with joe and he happened to get it right um but once they got into orbit uh with by the way baby yoda which was their wait a minute indicator. Yeah. what yeah. so was mando there because where he goes i go <laughs> the maybe maybe we the revealed way. the identity of of uh of the mandalorian <laughs> and now spacex Gets sued by sued. Disney. <laughs> yeah. So that's their zero gravity <laughs> indicator, right? Yep. Yep. They brought besides Baby Yoda the up with them, which is, Yeah, besides... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also... The people floating around did not indicate gravity well enough. Fake so. news, yeah. bro. Come on. <laughs> um, but, yeah, the only thing... The only other... Uh, there, there's, like, two small issues. One of them, um, there were some heat pumps that, that pump the radiator fluid, basically, or the, the actual... Um, the how you radiate heat away from the spacecraft and stuff. There's a bunch of pumps on there. They, they were seeing some like abnormal numbers and they actually had to like kind of switch some stuff on and off and change the thresholds of them in order to work properly. But then once they tweaked that, it was absolutely fine. Um, so there's not any, but if they hadn't figured that out, that actually could have caused a scrub of the mission, like an abort from orbit. Um, I don't think mm -hmm. that was ever really in the talk, but it was one of those things. It's like, it is critical. You have to have these radiators working. Um, you know, to have your spacecraft perform properly, you know, so. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing that happened that we're really seeing this morning now, guess what? Take a look at this. This is breaking news that you're now going to be seeing a day later for those of you listening. So I'm sure you've seen dun, it already. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> that was my um, news thing. Look at, so notice our, our picture here from our friend Trevor Malman. Notice how Oops. close this, this booster is to the edge. Remember it landed in the middle. Yeah. Dead center. And let's take a look here at the live feed at Port Canaveral. Look, notice an angle on this thing. Do you uh -huh. notice how angled this thing is? Take a look at it rolling in. You can really see it. It's oh, like it an has, Italian tower. It is absolutely. Torre. This thing is leaning off to one side big time. A whole leg is off the ground. Yeah. Hmm. In other words, I mean, this limped back in to port. Still Sorry, we're looking at the booster. For those, of you, bounds. for those of you just listening, yeah, uh, the booster 1061, uh, or yeah, 1061 barely made it back into port. It is like up against the railing, 
Uh, Octagrabber holding onto it for dear life. And it still seems to... You'd say that's like a 15 degree tilt, maybe? It's substantial. I mean, it's definitely more than like three or... It's probably more than three or four. I don't know about 15, but it's a lot. It's it's a lot. Um, Hmm. Yeah, so it, it... it barely made it back into port. It looks like here's some close up shots. Is from that, so it Space landed Flight. in the middle and then what it slid around or something like yep. the ocean. Yeah. So this means that they would have eaten up some, some crushed core in order to get the, the legs to, to shrink like that at all. They had to have chewed through some crushed core. There's these, these aluminum honeycomb. Yummy. Uh, crushed cores inside <laughs> there that it's like that a new they, cereal. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> if you if you basically get through the travel of the leg, because the legs will have some travel, you know, some suspension to them. And then after that, there's still some emergency crush core that will intentionally crush uh, so that it doesn't damage the booster. Right. Or the, you know, or break the legs. Uh, you, they have some additional give in them through these crush cores. And those do not rebound. Then, you know, if you go through the absorption of the crush cores, they will not rebound back into position. So this thing likely chewed through some crush chewed through some crush core. I don't think this would have happened on the ocean um, to make it this wobbly. I, I just can't imagine. But yeah, look at it there. It, I mean, it just looks like it barely made it back into port. You just need a little COPV, pop it back on the in the center there. Yeah, a little what? <laughs> oh. A little COPV. <laughs> oh, but it's a. Uh, yeah, honestly, like this is important because they were planning to reuse this booster, as you guys know. And uh, yeah, if they hadn't done that, <laughs> if they hadn't recovered it, that would have been pretty bad. That NASA was they even got scrubbed from Saturday. You guys remember how the launch was supposed to be Saturday? They mm-hmm. moved it to Sunday because not because the weather was bad at the launch pad. If they weren't trying to recover the booster, they probably would have been able to attempt Saturday. But because when the when the drone ship left port. The seas were so rough, it couldn't get out to the landing site in time. Because of that fact, NASA, the customer, actually scrubbed the mission. Not SpaceX. So this is no longer even SpaceX saying, like, hey, we're not going to recover our booster. Therefore, like, you know, we better scrub because, you know, it's worth our money. Now NASA, the customer, was like, hey, we're, we're, we need this booster back. Hmm. So let's wait. And they moved it to Sunday. So sorry, what I zoned out there. What was the reason why they why they scrubbed it? Uh, because the, the the drone ship was taking too long to get out, like oh, from okay. port, okay. getting out there. It was a really rough sea state, so it took them a while. Well, that was always the thing that I wondered about. Like, I understand why you're you're landing out to sea. There's you know a million reasons why that's a good idea, but just the sea itself is so unpredictable. I've always thought, like, I mean. That has to really make this harder. Like, I, I don't know if it would be possible, but imagine if you like could take off from Florida, have your booster land on Cuba or something like that, you know, like at a launch pad, a landing zone. It, it seems like it, it just being on ground would be a much better, it would reduce some of that fact, some of those, you know, variables because the sea is just crazy. It's absolutely nuts how turbulent things can be. So the, the and you have zero is- way to control it. The sea is crazy, but the thing about the sea, well, I don't know if that really factors too much in the scrubbing conditions. The, to me, the better solution, because if you land it on another island or something, which is rare because you'd have to be flying over that island, which obviously right. we try to avoid at right. all costs. <laughs> but, you know, it's Elon. Um, he could just buy an island somewhere. <laughs> but the, the thing about that is then you have to unload the booster onto a ship and ship it back to the landing pad. And so you're actually like adding complexity and adding... You know, machinery but if it were to increase people. the cost or the likelihood of landing it successfully, I mean, I know that they've proven this, but I guess just at the it high level, like when it. you sit down to make up these plans, I have to imagine somebody being like, "Uh, uh maybe we don't try to do it on the ocean." You know, well, <laughs> like, I think that I think a better option would be a bigger landing vessel, so that oh, they go, don't yeah. have to worry about it as much. You know, a bigger vessel that's less prone to these conditions. Like Blue Origin ship is freaking huge. Hmm. It should be a lot less Is that susceptible the name of it? to sea states. No, Blue Origins. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're a vessel freaking huge. Uh, <laughs> but well, this I, makes me wonder. Well, New Glenn is going to be a lot bigger than Falcon 9, too. Exactly. It just comes to mind because I, I have friends that are pilots in the Navy, and, and they talk about landing on aircraft carriers and mm-hmm. how absolutely bonkers it is sometimes. Like yeah. the entire aircraft carrier is just like doing this while you're going insanely fast, basically trying to crash land and catch this <laughs> yeah. wire. Right. You know? And if you and don't, those things I don't are know if so you guys big. know about this, but, it, but when you land, you actually accelerate, you hit the right. throttle. Yep. Uh, because if you miss the wire, you need to take off again. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you hammer at full throttle when you land. 
Yeah, exactly. As as and and this is why the 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 youngest lowest rank members their cabins are like right below where those where that wire spools out from. Oh jeez. <laughs> so you're trying to sleep and just, you know, just jets are basically crash landing <laughs> on top of you and yeah. Anyways, I got a lot of friends uh, in the Navy living here, so <laughs> we yeah. got all these oh, good sure. stories. But think about how big, you know, an aircraft carrier is. Yeah. 20 times bigger than this, you know, the landing vessel. <laughs> yeah. So maybe SpaceX could uh, buy an old <laughs> aircraft carrier someday. You you <laughs> totally could. I mean, well, if you guys, you know, I don't know, maybe we'll do an OLF on top of the USS Midway here or something like that. But <laughs> there, there's a bunch of old ones here that you can go tour. And even the, I mean, the old ones I imagine are still quite a bit bigger than these drone ships, but the new ones are like incredibly massive. It's, oh, it's ridiculous. It's like a floating city almost, you know. It is. I, I forget. Like uh, someone will, in Discord can check, but I think it's like three or four thousand people that are on board. It's, that ship. I think it's more than that. I think they're like ten. Th- I just no. recently saw this. I, I was comparing the U.S. Navy's like biggest aircraft 5, carrier to the, to the next yeah. biggest countries, and it's like it's a it's joke. The, it's a <laughs> it's a joke. It's like what? Are yeah. we, why are we spending so much money well, on these floating and, cities? And, and I, I know when they send out um, a MU or whatever they call it, a Marine Expeditionary Unit, th- there are a, you know an aircraft carrier doesn't go out by itself. Typically, right. I don't believe it. There's a whole slew of ships that go around with it, you know, destroyers and LHDs and all these other things. So, um, yeah. but this, you know, this may, brings up a, you know, I know this is breaking protocol, but why don't they Ooh. just make a bigger vessel and do some stuff with it? Why don't they yeah. just? Why don't this they is breaking just? protocol? Come on, Ben. I don't why know don't how to handle just... myself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get. That's the level of, of effort you get right there for for breaking it like that. <laughs> the minimum. Yeah, see, so five to six thousand. That's right. So yeah, so this is actually a response to one of your tweets, uh, Tim, and, and it's from Pedro who says, Why don't they just dot 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 turn the drone ships into refurbishing ships? Refer refurbish refurbish refurbish. <laughs> <laughs> refurbishing. I never know which is the right way. Uh, why don't they just turn them into refurbishing ships so that when it gets to port, it's already ready for flight? Hmm. It's think? already ready. What do you uh, guys think? Uh, I don't uh, know what all goes into refurbishing a Falcon 9, so it's hard yeah. to say. I think you just got to, well, and when Starship's out there, it's just giant cans of WD-40 cleaning it. So <laughs> with the Falcon 9, I'm not sure. But yeah, that, that would be my question is how much of that is even doable on a drone ship or, I mean, I suppose if you had an aircraft carrier size ship, you could probably get more serious about those kind of things. But, it, 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 you know, it's one of those things, like, trying to do a job without the right tools can be incredibly frustrating and slow. And then when you have the right tools and stuff, you're like, oh, that was easy. You know, like changing yeah. the brakes on your car with, you know, uh, <laughs> crescent wrenches or something versus impact wrenches. It's just a completely different ball game. That would be my guess. Um, yeah. Is that it just does, it's like if you get it to port and you have a whole station set up and you can just kind of run it through there super quick and it's more efficient to do it that way would be, that'd be my guess why you wouldn't do that. But there might be some things you could do. I don't know. What about you, Joe? What do you think? Ben's still working on a string on his sleeve apparently. It's really (laughs) bothering me. It's really (laughs) bothering me. I need to make fire. I have a battery. I can make fire. Oh no. Here comes Mark Watney. If we see a sudden disconnect from things, just just call I'm gonna, 911. I'm going to sign <laughs> out of this. <laughs> uh, what about you, Joe? What do you think? Uh, I mean, so, okay, I'm going to jump ship just a little bit and, and go to Starship because one of my bigger concerns slash skepticisms about Starship is like, and I know it's a whole different platform and it's a whole different vehicle and everything, but, uh, you know, they talk about like, it's going to come back and land right at the pad and they're just going to put another thing on top and it takes off and, and it's just going to be boom, boom, boom. As soon as you can get the, the fuel into it. Um, and then I look at like how much is required to refurbish a Falcon nine. I mean, just, just looking at them when they come in and it's got soot all over it and, and, you know, it's kind of been through the ringer and, um, I don't, I don't see how that's going to work with Starship with that. I mean, with them being able to just like launch it again, you know, um, the reason why I'm going there is Mm -hmm. because like, I don't think you have to necessarily 
take a Falcon 9 and launch it immediately anyway, because there's so many others that are already kind of sitting out there ready to go. Um, you can kind of alternate them out. You don't have to like turn it around that fast, but that is the plan for Starship. You know, mm-hmm. that's kind of why I jump ship and started talking about that. Um, so I guess my answer for this one would be because they don't need to necessarily for the Falcon mm. 9 program. Right. Um, but for Starship, they will need to. So yeah. Right. Uh, and just real quick to answer, start, one of the biggest refurbishment issues is literally just the Merlin engines. Like they had to borrow scope them every time, double do some cleaning to get the soot out of the engines. And all of that is because they burn RP1. So as soon as they get to Methalox and, you know, okay. the, the Raptor engine, the re- refurbishment process should be just checkouts, making sure that, you know, everything's good to go for the next flight. Some of that could be automated. You know, it might be like a spin check, make sure the bearings aren't wobbling. You know, a lot of these could be internal sensors and stuff. Like it could all be eventually, you know, this is all, you know, someday once they have sure. yeah. thousands of engine fires and stuff. But um, I, yeah, I think as far as the Falcon 9, I think it's really an uh, interesting concept to have a bigger vessel, have it lay the booster down mm-hmm. as soon as it lands, put it under the deck or something, and, and have people there working on it while it's for the two or three days that it comes back into port, you know? I like, definitely see the advantage of laying it down. Right. As mm-hmm. opposed to just having in the in the seas as but it's coming it, back. It's kind of like a refrigerator, right? It has to be transported that way. No, it, it can actually be transported because it gets transported oh. across the interstates horizontally. Right, right, right. But when they, after it lands, it has to dump all the fuel and it does or whatever else, fuel. whatever's left, right? And and depressurize to a safe degree. Right, yeah. So it has to kind of, and then you could lay it down. Then right? you can lay it down, yep. Just like Got just it. like on land. You know, the, once it lands on land, they do lay it horizontally and truck it to a hangar. So the idea is, why don't you basically have a hangar on board and have a bigger vessel tip it over horizontally, you know, put it into the hangar and have people start doing checkouts right there on the ship. I'm guessing it all comes down to like, is it cheaper to have a small ship in a small amount of fuel going out to where it's doing, doing what they're doing and then bring it back to port and, and doing it there? Or is it more expensive to pay those people that now have to be out on the vessel, you know, cause now you're paying a team of however many, we'll say a dozen more people that are on the ship that are sit out there waiting. Even if the booster doesn't come in that first day or whatever, two days or whatever, well, you're paying all these people on the boat. You're paying for a bigger boat. You're paying for more fuel. You're paying for all these other things to save a couple days. I just don't know. Well, well, and, and there's a reason why the drone ship is a drone ship. Yeah. Like you don't necessarily want people on a thing when a rocket is going to be landing yeah. on top of it. So right? you'd have to have another support vessel that, go right. out there after it autonomously like goes horizontal or whatever. Right. And if you did want an aircraft carrier, they cost $13 billion. There we so go. Let's do there's that. that. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I <laughs> Probably mean, could I, make a few more starships and just scrap them at that point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I just, I just feel like it's one of those things that, cause they aren't, they aren't pressed yet on time. It's not like, you know, maybe a starship sh- might be starship might be like that turnaround time really does matter. It really gets into their bottom line, but Falcon 9, there's just not even demand yet. Yes. Starlink's like ramping up like crazy, but you know, we're still at like a 50 day turnaround. So taking three days off of that turnaround time. Starlink? Is this the Starlink missions? Yeah. Oh, I'm like, sorry. I thought you were the top. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So when they do <laughs> Starlink missions, you know, their, their quickest turnaround time to date of a Falcon 9 booster is about 50 days. So, like, removing three days of tra- transit time refurbishment isn't really getting them that far ahead on that process. Mm-hmm. But if it was uh, to the I point mean, where they're trying to turn them around in a week, you know, and they're, like, trying to fly the same booster every week, yeah, those three days, that's half your, that's half of that time, you know, that yeah. is substantial. But right now, it's just probably not worth the time and the money, especially as they're just working on Starship stuff. So, why, like, let's not invest anymore in the Falcon 9 when it's doing its thing. Good enough. If they wanted, if they were wanting Falcon 9 to be their rocket for the next 30 years and it was really more of a long term thing, yeah, they could probably invest in some things like that. But they're going all in on Starship right now. There you go. Yeah. I think, yeah, that's, that was, a, I like that. Why don't they just, though? Yeah. So what else do we yeah. have this week, guys? Well, while we're talking about, um, just real quick, I was thinking earlier, going back a little bit, but the, the footage of the, the four astronauts coming out to go to the, to the pad, mm-hmm. um, I, what was it? It was just the last couple of days. I, I watched, finally watched that Challenger final flight oh, yeah. documentary series on Netflix. And 
watching seven astronauts come out of that that gangway to go get on the on the shuttle i was just it was like it was like a clown car or something like seeing that many astronauts getting into a vehicle just kind of like brought home how remarkable that was yeah like yeah uh, uh, until we get starship up i don't see us ever having that many people on a on a flight again right well the whole documentary made me both more appreciative of the space shuttle and also realize what a just disaster the whole thing was i mean i mean it was just they were pushing their luck every single time they went up with that thing they really were you know it was like i have more appreciation for some parts of it now than i did before like uh, in the past couple years than i ever did but also like same thing it's like it just yeah (laughs) it was unbelievable like i mean Mm -hmm. i can't even look at the thing without almost crying at how beautiful and amazing it was but it's just like do you think i know there's like the mini it's a unmanned space shuttle looking thing uncrewed oh sorry whatever (laughs) unpersoned tim (laughs) unhuman um yeah uh anyways yeah but that that thing's going up but we'll never see a space plane like no one's really well. Serious I mean about that one that you're one talking those, right? about. Well, there's the X-37B, but there's mm-hmm. also uh, Sierra Nevada's Dream Sierra Chaser, Nevada. but that one is currently scheduled to be able to do uh, cargo. But they still plan and want to have it launch people too. There's so something might... about it. I think that just, I, I mean, it speaks to the terrestrial in all of us that it should look like a plane. It should feel like it should. <laughs> that's like what we associate with flight. Right. Right, the yeah. capsules don't like. I mean, and I just know this firsthand from my five-year-old, who <laughs> who really doesn't get that we're sending people to space not in a space shuttle. They right. he just it's really hard. I'm like, it's that little thing. He's like, but where's the wings? How is it gonna fly? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, these are great questions. <laughs> this makes a lot of sense. But did you, know, you realize this was the first time there's been four people in a capsule? Ever. This is the first time right, in history there's been more that. than three in. So, fun fact, the Apollo capsule technically could hold five in an emergency. And the one that was actually, if you've ever been to the Kennedy Space Center, both of you guys have, uh, you know when you see the Saturn V out there in the big Saturn V building? I didn't get to see it. But but Joe, you did though, right? Because that's where you were viewing from that first day. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where it's on. Yes. I saw it. Yeah. And how there was an Apollo capsule out there. There's actually Mm -hmm. like a command module and everything. That particular Apollo capsule was originally a backup Apollo capsule for Skylab. If they had to do, or no, uh, for Apollo Soyuz or something, it's it's mm-hmm. a rescue capsule that originally had five seats in it. So if there were to be uh, something that would happen, they could send it up and get astronauts back down safely. It was either Skylab or or Apollo Soyuz, but yeah. Um, cool. So they could technically put five in it, but they never did. So this is the first time in history there were four people on board. And I just thought that was cool. Yeah, that's cool. Well, you're you're talking about the uh, Kennedy Space Center and now um, uh, looking at the shuttle brings a tear to your eye, kind of thing. Like the the Atlantis exhibit there. I know. Well, the um, Yuri's Night thing was held underneath it and everything. But um, let me just let me just say for anybody who is remotely interested, like when when I they they kind of bring you into this room. And they, they have this almost like 360 degree screens, not 360, but like maybe 180 screens all over. And they're like showing all these highlights from Atlantis and everything. And and I'll be honest, I'm sitting there kind of like, okay, whatever. And it was just like so bombastic. And I'm rolling my eyes because I'm such a cynic and everything. And then at the end of it, they like raise up all the screens and it's like, there's Atlantis. Like the actual space shuttle is like there in front of you. Yeah, and I had I to like that. compose myself before yeah. I could walk in there because I was like, Ugh! It just, it like just wave just came over me of emotion. Yeah. yeah. It just same. I had that exact same experience where I was kind of like, well, cheesy, cheesy. And then all of a sudden, like, <laughs> right when like years the re- in the making, right? And it's then, like a little. <laughs> and then when the, yeah, when the, when the reveal happens, it's like, <laughs> yeah. we, it's... we had to walk out of that uh, with our, our, what was he, three year old at the time? Because the screens and the lights and everything were just loud and it was too much oh. for him. He, he started crying and freaking out like he couldn't handle it whatsoever. So we had to, but then we got to come back in or I think we, you can exit sort of into the spatial area. Mm-hmm. So we like went and saw it before everyone else got over there, which was kind of nice. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, the, yeah. What's the one in LA? The Discovery? Uh, 
No, Discovery's in DC. Um, Endeavor? LA has Endeavor. I Endeavor. Think. Yeah. yeah. We, I thought I I still think that's one of the coolest thing. I mean, obviously the one at Kennedy Space Center is open and you can see much more stuff, right? But it's just cool being able to walk underneath it, literally. Mm-hmm. You right know, there. and then and then they're going to raise it up in that in their new permanent home and build the whole thing around it. I, we talked about this before, yeah. but it's just something really cool about just being able to yeah, see it that close, you know, it's really great. Well, the cool thing though about the new exhibit, they'll have like ramps. So those of you that don't know, what when they're going to basically do an actual stack with Endeavor right. at the California Science Center, like full-blown vertical in its flight configuration with two solid rocket boosters, a real external fuel tank, everything legit flight hardware. And then they're going to have like almost ramps and all these viewing platforms all the way up, but almost like when they're working on it in the vehicle assembly building. So you will be able to get up maybe even closer to it. Yeah. But just like at certain like, you know, dissections almost as as you ascend vertically. But I think that's going to be the coolest thing ever. I can't wait. Um, yeah. We'll see. Yeah. So uh so we had a little technical glitch here. Do we wanna do we need to go into a, a quick little break here? Let's let's see. Okay. <laughs> we'll be right back. Hey everyone, today's ludicrous sponsor is Skillshare. We've heard of Skillshare before on this channel. So Skillshare, uh, so, we're, so we're three lucky dudes who have been able to make the leap from like working in office jobs to working for ourselves full time, except for Tim, who's never had a real job in his life. But, uh, you mm-hmm. know, I think it's safe to say that we all love being able to set our own hours and not be on somebody else's clock. I know I wouldn't trade it for the world. And if it's something that you're interested in, if you've been wanting to get out of the daily grind, there's an excellent class I can recommend called Going Freelance, Building and Branding Your Own Success over on Skillshare. Ooh. And I think I can pull that up. How about I just pull that up, guys? So Show you can it to see me. what I'm talking about. Show me the money, Joe. I don't share my screen as fast as you youngins. <laughs> but there it is. So this class is taught by uh, Justin Gignac and Claire Wasserman. They're from the group Working Not Working. They're a community of uh, freelance uh, recruit. They're kind of a cre- freelance creative recruitment hub. I'll get it out eventually. Uh, and freelance. in this class, they share what they've learned from you know working with thousands of freelancers that they've had over the years, what strategies work, which don't, how to create a sustainable income for your business and being your own boss and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty cool. This is, of course, just one of thousands of classes on Skillshare covering everything from business essentials, productivity, web development, video production, even beer brewing. They have a class on beer brewing. Uh, So basically, if you're interested in it, there's an expert ready to teach it to you on Skillshare. So join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer just for our listeners. We've got Skillshare is offering our ludicrous future listeners unlimited access to thousands of classes for free for a limited time. To sign up, just go to Skillshare.com slash OLF pod. Again, it's Skillshare.com slash OLF pod. And who wants to take the third round of that? Skillshare.com slash OLF pod. You got it. Be a better you. For all of us. So we've talked about Brilliant on this channel before. I've talked about it on my channel for quite a while now. And uh, Brilliant, in case you don't know, it's a great learning uh, application, great learning website where you can learn things by solving problems and it kind of teaches you fundamental science stuff. But if you haven't ever checked it out and you want to kind of dabble your toe in a little bit, one of the favorite classes that I have on there that I keep going back to is called the Physics of the Everyday Course. Because there are so many things in our lives that we just kind of turn on and we go about our day, but there's some really interesting science behind those things. And that's basically what this course teaches you. You want to know exactly how your refrigerator works? You'll get a good handle on it in five minutes in this class. Want to know why bridges are built the way they are? It's explained here. You'll learn all about the physics of your toilet, of bike riding, how water towers work, even how to win at axe throwing. It just gives you a whole new level of appreciation for the things around you. And you'll do it through 38 interactive quizzes featuring puzzles and games that engage your problem solving skills to come up with the answers on your own. And that's what's cool about Brilliant. It forces you to think like a scientist and it it lets you frame it in a way that makes the most sense to you. This of course is just one of other dozens of courses on Brilliant, like I said before, spanning relativistic physics, quantum mechanics, even logic and all levels of math. And if you just like solving problems and keeping your brain fresh, there's daily challenges that you can pull up and just have fun with in your spare time. 
You can sign up for free and test it out for yourself if you go to brilliant.org slash OLF and the first 200 people to sign up will get 20% off a premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses. I've been talking about Brilliant on my channel for years now. They've been always getting better and adding new stuff, so I'm a fan. Anyway, it's brilliant.org slash OLF. Go check it out. I think you'll like it. Oh, well, welcome back. Is, is that where we're at now? Are we back to the show? Also, I have to say, I lament you saying I've never had a real job. <laughs> <sighs> no, the reason I say that is because we brought this up one time and I was like, mm. hey, have you ever like had a had a job like in an office or whatever? And you were like, no. Well, I did work at a camera store for a year. I've been directly Retail. clocking in nine to five. What about restaurants? Come on, both of you guys have worked in restaurants. I actually yeah. have, yeah. I mean, yeah. A real job is a very vacuous term, I admit. But a uh, growing up job, or one where you not necessarily grow, one where you clock in and like have to respond to someone else directly. Like I think and, that's kind yeah. of like what we like because I think all of these, you know, a lot of hard work. Obviously, when like working at a restaurant is yeah. really hard. I <laughs> remember when working in IT, we were salaried but they made us work absolutely insane hours and we had pagers in case something went down and we would get you know paged at 2 a.m to get up and fix something and so eventually there was a lawsuit about this and and the it folks lobby group whoever won so at least in arizona where i lived you could not be a salaried employee anymore um, because you were just end up working 70 hours a week you know, because if they wake you up at 3 a.m. to respond to something, even if it only takes you 15 minutes, you just lost at least an hour or two of sleep. And mm -hmm. that just wrecks your whole day, right? So it was one of those things where the these groups got together and said, no, 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 we're hourly. And if you contact me whatsoever for any reason at all, mm -hmm. then I'm going to charge you for two hours of work. I don't care if it was like a yes, no question that took me 30 seconds or five seconds. Like, hmm. so That's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, I remember the good no, old I, days. I truly think that everybody should have to work a restaurant job and a retail job at some point. It yes. just it, it just makes you I treat everybody so much better mm -hmm. at some point. Seriously. Good perspective. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, Joe, do you want to share? We kind of had some bad news popping up, right? Crashing, you might say. Mm. Yeah. Ooh. So we actually talked about this a while back. Um, mm -hmm that the the damage at the Arecibo telescope down in Puerto Rico uh, it's 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 getting worse so <sighs> back in August so I'm just going to kind of read a little bit off this is from space.com it says that uh, last last August the uh, one of the main cables unexpectedly snapped and crashed down um, into the are there actually pictures of this the yeah there we dish. go yeah. So image of the damage of the Arecibo telescope. The source has been in August, but I guess things have gotten worse since then. And it's starting to look like they just, they, they might just have to either scrap the whole thing or, uh, or maybe. Yeah. <sighs> Coronavirus insane. coming for us all, man. That's insane. Now it's got the satellite. Cause the what happened to another, another, uh, cable snap, didn't it? Yeah. On November 6th. It says nobody was expecting the snap on November 6th as they were trying to repair the damage from August, basically. So uh, more, more stuff is falling apart, unfortunately. So is it in risk of the whole like receiver thing crashing into the disc too now? I'm like you'd sure. think if collapse is the word I saw used. I don't know if that's just a, some clickbait, but. Oh man. Yeah. That was, so there were some hurricanes that blew through. There was a series of earthquakes um, in January. <laughs> So, I mean, it's just been one thing after another for it. Um, so oh, the first it sounds cable like they are, out, they, I didn't realize they actually called it. They are decommissioning it. Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah. Oh, man. There's no way to fix it without risking human lives. Jeez. Mm. Evaluating That's the situation terrible. is also difficult since reaching the suspended platform and the towers that anchor the supporting cables is dangerous. Oh, man. 2020. Yeah. I know of all the things. <laughs> Jeez, of all the things Seriously. that are going down. So there, there's still the big one in China. So we don't. It's not like we're losing all of our abilities here or anything. There's, there's a bigger one that's gone up in China. Um, Does China publish their scientific findings publicly, well, though? That's the question. Yeah, I don't know. Man, we, we certainly don't have the same access to it we do in Puerto Rico. Yeah. You know? Right. Yeah. Well, China. I mean, China, frankly, does a ton of science. I mean, they're kicking out science like crazy. I mean, I just don't know how 
much they always and how openly they share their their findings and publish them in you know in journals and stuff immediately i i just don't know if it's as transparent as the rest of the world or most of the rest of the world you know but, yeah. well, was this part of the tim you maybe know there's a bunch of headlines i've been seeing about uh a new giant telescope on the moon people are looking to build i mean this was this was like oh yeah that one's going to die but you know we got we got more coming we're got a, you know, we got a new there's, one. I mean, there's always like a million plans for cool ideas, but I don't know if, has that ever actually been fleshed out, but using a crater basically as a giant, there we go. Uh, I was actually <laughs> pulling that up as you were talking about it, but this is on NASA's website. Um, this is from April of this year. So they were talking about it, but yeah, basically using a crater and stringing some, some lines across it and turning it into a giant radio telescope on the far side of the moon. That'd be so cool. Uh, can I actually open? Yeah, there we go. That would really be cool. So what's really cool about that is it's totally blocked from all the noise from Earth. Yeah. Because right. we got radio signals going. Yeah, I mean, we're yep. just awash in them over here. See, the one the one I have is a little bit different here. Let me share my screen, Joe. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I literally can't. Great. Uh, <laughs> I'm filibustering the screen sharing right now. So yeah, people here, can see the little robots. Let me hit you the one so cool. the, with the one I just saw there. Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> fine fine people uh yeah this is one that was new to me this uh texas astronomers you mm. know going big as texas does uh yeah. <laughs> ultimately <laughs> old rip how you doing mm -hmm. shout out to old rip uh ultimately large telescope on the moon so this was new to me and it was like my feed of news was like oh the arecibo thing is gonna die but hey hey the you know no, all is not lost we've got this thing here so the Lunar Liquid Mirror Telescope, have you guys heard about this? Hmm. I've seen pictures of it, but I didn't really know exactly what it was. Yeah, because this was news. To, this was different than what I, you know, had uh, had looked up before. But I feel like, yeah, the James Webb is still going to be the biggest thing ever, right? Like all of these are like cute ideas right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, you want it? Oh, that's cute. Just wait till this guy comes in. You know. I don't know if James Webb does radio though. Oh, do you know okay. Tim? Um, and I know it's, it's more infrared and and um, yeah, yeah. I it's definitely um, it's definitely infrared, right? Mm. Yeah, it's not yeah. visible light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know about. Mm. I don't really think it does anything in the radio spectrum per se. Well, speaking of shooting up to the stars, Tesla stock is on another tear. <laughs> uh, with there was a recent announcement that they will be included in the Standard and Poor's index, the S and P five hundred, as you probably know it. Uh, made Elon do this kick with it made his him shoes. not Poor's. Oh, <laughs> yeah. What, what, what did he make another eighty five billion over the weekend or something? I think he's the third he richest the guy third, in the world now. He's the third richest. Yeah. That's uh, so what is it, Bezos? Uh, Zuckerberg. Is it Zuckerberg or no, is it he, Warren Buffett? He, he overturned Zuckerberg. No. He oh, took he his did. spot. Yep. Finally. Toddler <laughs> CEO. Get him out of here. Uh, <coughs> yeah, so so they're, they're going to be included in the S&P 500, which is like this big index. If you're not familiar with uh, some of the most, you know, the, the biggest companies, the, the biggest 500, whatever, in the U.S. And uh, S&P is, is often, you know, a lot of, a lot of like index funds have S&P stuff. So there's actually, there's been a lot of reluctance because Tesla's volatility uh, or perceived volatility, uh, you know, you didn't want to like, because a lot of people's retirement funds are wrapped up in the S&P and stuff like that. And if you throw in a company who's not proven themselves fully, uh, you know, it could really mess with a lot of people's uh, financial futures. Um, so apparently they feel that Tesla has finally achieved that. I think a lot of fans would have would argue, oh, they, you know, 2008, they should have been included or something, right? <laughs> but <laughs> they, they, they put a battery in the in a car. Woo, S&P. <laughs> but, but now they're there um, and, or, or they will be there. I believe it's December. Um, and so you can see uh, who else they join here. I thought this would, would be an interesting one. So uh, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Alphabet, Alphabet, Berkshire Hathaway. There's uh, Warren Buffett for you. So you can just kind of see like like these are all big well, giant Home companies. Depot is in the top right there. Mm hmm. Wow. Jeez. Mm -hmm. It looks like they like messed up. Their you think they'd be here. able to afford to hire people to show you where stuff is? <laughs> <laughs> well, you must not have. You must have never been to Lowe's. 
uh, <laughs> because that that the, you ask him, hey, I need a screwdriver. He's like, what is that? It's a, <laughs> like it's a tool. Tools? I don't, what is it? Ouch, this is a flower dang. shop. Oh, the Lowe's is, is Lowe's is the just avoid Lowe's altogether, please. I'll save you all a I ton disagree. of time. I disagree. I have a great experience with my local Lowe's. Hmm, we are a divided yeah. podcast. Joe, Tri- please be indifferent trided? about Lowe's. I prefer Lowe's. Mm, yeah. See, dang, real dang. like handymen go to Home Depot. Just saying, you know. Well, I'm certainly not handy that, people. So. Thank you. Can we say handy Thank people? You. Jeez, I'm sorry. That sounds <laughs> creepy. <laughs> yeah. I just went there. Handy, handy persons. People. Handy Ugh. people. What is this? Right. What's going on? Menards. So, yeah, I'm a Menards boy. Give me that Menards. I don't know if you guys have that where you are. I don't know what Menards is. There's a town called Menard. Say big. They all I know is they uh they they have this weird harmony at the end of their like say big money at Menards and it's like super like chromatic at some point so it's just like <laughs> you say big money say big money when you shop Menards or something like really like chromatic and I'm just always like oh it's so weird <laughs> like that doesn't work yeah Stop. major minor major minor <laughs> so that's good news uh good news for Tesla. Stockholders, it looks like as of recording this, they just passed five hundred dollars. This is after the split, so what would that be like twenty five hundred dollars roughly? If you're thinking in old terms, uh, well, they yeah, had so hit they had hit five hundred before, like right at the uh-huh. split, like almost immediately after the split. Remember, it just skyrocketed for a few days. Yeah, um, yeah. And what it's is going their back peak up. ever? Five oh eight is their highest ever, so it's it's getting close to that. Yeah, you can kind of see here how it's just going. Yeah, it's like tied with their. All time mm-hmm. high, pretty much. Wow. Yeah. So, so if you look at five days, you could see. I think this is when the announcement came on the sixteenth. Yeah. Was it? Bam. Yep. You know, just kind of skyrocketed, jumped up another ten percent or something. Uh, one Crazy. month. Yeah, six months. Yeah, they're looking great. Uh, Tesla stock. I think Tesla stock last I saw was one of the uh, highest, like like the fastest growing of all the stocks in in the stock market here in the U.S. this year. Like even above Zoom or somebody like that that you know had kind of their their moment there, but wow. Um, speaking of big moments, you guys may notice mm. that I'm still in Iowa, still not in Texas. <laughs> How this is what week three where I genuinely thought like next week I'll be gone. I mean, I kind of like, thought I was like, is Tim going to be here today? I, I you know, as we were getting I have, ready, I, was I like, have Wait a actually minute. had my bags packed and about to head out the door. Like putting things in the car even. So the last time the big thing, so I'm kind of waiting for like pack, one more pack test. your bags pre-flight. <laughs> Stop. Is it, is it song? So, uh Sorry. I, I was watching this it. very intently, which what we thought was going to be just a fuel test. We got, kind of heard that it was only going to be a fuel test or something or a header, another test of the vehicle. And SpaceX went for a static fire with serial number 8 um at night. This was the 15th. And after it static fired, um, it was pretty short. You'll notice there's a lot of debris flown around again. Why is that? It said 50%. Am I at like two times speed or something? That did not look right to me. Normal. That looked too fast to me. I don't quite get it. <laughs> My computer playing things too fast or something. Okay. That looks more normal. I don't know. And then, and then does it wobble or is that the camera wobbling? That's the camera wobbling from the shock. And the oh, sound wave. Okay. So um, what happened, we got some answers on this. So first off, the next day, basically, one of the Raptor engines came off, number 32, um, and Austin Bernard got this picture of it. It looks fine on the outside, but apparently the inside, well, Elon said, just a scratch, we can buff it out. Uh, Apparently the inside got a little bit melty. Um, So Elon went on to explain kind of what happened. Um, We lost vehicle pneumatics, reason unknown at present. Liquid oxygen header tank pressure is rising. So this was, oh yeah, yeah. So this was, sorry, let me, let me go back to setting the scene. I kind of forgot about what happened. The last week's been such a blur. And well, just before (laughs) this, do you remember a few days? So last week when we were recording, if I remember, they had the serial number eight static fire where concrete got blown around. Remember we talked about how like it obviously wasn't molten because it wasn't illuminated the whole time. Like as the static fire dimmed the, so did the debris. So we could kind of prove that it was, but the same type of thing happened again where more junk got kicked up, right? And as it got kicked up, all of a sudden, uh, this is while it's still on the pad, we saw 
Elon saying we lost vehicle pneumatics. Reason unknown at present. Liquid header tank pressure is rising. Hopefully, uh, it will trigger the burst discs to relieve pressure. Otherwise, it's going to pop the core. <clears throat> so, in other words, it was sitting on the pad. They lost control of being able to open the valves to, to vent it after it did that little static fire. And all of a sudden, they, could, yeah, they couldn't open the valves. Luckily, they do have a, a, a burst disc, which is literally just like a piece of metal with some scorches in it that, that make it so um, it, that would uh, you know blow up before the whole tank ruptures. And that did work. Uh, once the pressure rose enough inside the oxygen header tank, which is at the top of the nose, that burst disc worked. It opened up and relieved the pressure in the in the nose. So um, it was, yeah, it's it's like a mechanical fuse. Andy Law says in our Discord. I think that's exactly right. It's basically like a kind of like a yeah, like a, a fuse in your car. You know how it's like instead of overloading the wire in your car, overloading something, you intentionally have it so there's a weak point that dip, that bursts, and that's exactly what happened here. The pressure got down, so Elon then announced burst disc worked. So vehicle appears to be okay. We'll have to swap out at least one of the engines. We learned more about this. Um, he said about two seconds after starting engines, the, the martite covering concrete uh, below shattered, sending blades of hardened rock into engine bay. One rock blade severed avionics cable, causing uh, bad shutdown of Raptor. So it was that stuff that was flying around. Yep. Interesting. And then uh, I guess he said that avionics cables moving to steel pipe shields and adding water-cooled steel pipes to test pad. Oh, I didn't see this. When was this? Was that today or two days ago? I missed this. Um, So, yeah, it looks like he's going to be, um, they're going to be adding some, they're going to be putting the cables inside of a a shield, basically, and then adding water-cooled steel pipes to the test pad, and that should prevent debris. I still thought, you know, I thought this whole time that they'd end up doing, you know, like a proper flame diverter, you know, a flame trench type of thing or some kind of thing so that you can't have debris shooting back up into the rocket, you know, because they're basically, when they fire those three Raptor engines, it's almost the same amount of thrust as a Falcon 9, you know. So imagine a Falcon 9 just sitting there 10 meters off the ground, 30 feet off the ground or whatever, just shooting at concrete. Like, mm-hmm. I, I just can't imagine that going well. <laughs> and, Why don't they well, just? Yeah. I mean, I've been wondering this whole time about, like, at what point do they need to actually do some some water uh, system, suppression system or, or something? Because, I mean, like, in my head, it was always like, this is just prototype stage. This is just testing. They don't have to have it all laid out like it would be for, like, real flight or whatever. But if it's going to be damaging the engines, <laughs> right. then maybe they need to do something like that. Right. I mean... Or so, maybe yeah, just so, shielding it like he was talking about is enough. I don't know. But. So there's a few a few trains of thought and a few things that are, are interesting, and Discord is talking about it right now. Um, th- so first off, there is a little bit of water there. I don't think they use it to like do sound suppression. I think it's literally there to put out fires afterwards. Like They have these remote-controlled hoses oh. mm-hmm. that they'll sometimes spray down sections after it fires. Um, but then uh, Flow in Discord also mentions, don't forget this vehicle is hoping to land on the moon and Mars. But for the moon, we've seen that they have auxiliary landing engines for this purpose. So they don't disrupt the soil too much and and do exactly what we're talking about and put bits of debris into orbit and all that stuff. But for Mars, they're going to probably be landing with the main engines. I don't think a Mars vehicle will have auxiliary landing engines. And it makes you wonder, how do you avoid debris hitting the engines and hitting the vehicle while you land? They're going to have a spare Raptor engine? Nerf. (sighs) You make the world out of Nerf. (laughs) I mean, it brings up some serious logistics. You know, at some point, of course, you could probably have a landing pad. But how do you create a landing pad without landing on Mars first with a pretty heavy vehicle? You know, it has to be a pretty substantial vehicle to build a landing pad. That that's I think I've mentioned this before. Like, how do you get off Mars? It it seems incredibly difficult. (laughs) You know, yeah, because there's not a, a launch pad there, right? Yeah, no launch pad, no landing pad. You're just and and if you if you touch down, let's say, in the wrong place, you you're stuck there. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I how I, I don't know. I suppose you could move it, the ship somehow. <laughs> like, you know, even though it's less gravity than here, you know, I imagine a space <sighs> ship <There's>... still <laughs> weighs quite a bit. It is kind of interesting that you couldn't get to orbit with the fir- the the upper stage here on earth but i'm guessing on mars you can because less gravity oh yeah yeah you can actually get all the way from mars to earth 
on a fully fueled starship. And also less air resistance. A lot less air out. resistance. Yeah. There's no atmosphere, right? One yeah. percent. So yeah. ver- enough enough to actually really aid in slowing down. Luckily, you know, because mm-hmm. when you're going, you know, crazy fast from interplanetary, you know, intercept speeds, uh, you know, that c- small amount of atmosphere still compresses a lot. Just like mm-hmm. you know, in the upper atmosphere, when you're returning from orbit, you know, you're not going into the thick part. Of your, you know, the d- the biggest bits of deceleration are in very thin portions of atmosphere. So that's actually a lot like landing on Mars. And actually, they hmm. want to land in lower altitudes of Mars so the air is a little bit more dense and they can they can get as much out of the atmosphere as they can. So it's actually advantageous to land in certain regions that are a little bit lower in atmosphere to, or lower uh, altitude to help aid in that as much as you can. Right. Yeah. Since well, it is what so is the plan to get off of Mars? Do, do we know? Are there official, like, I, you know, proposals? I mean, in situ resource utilization, they'll have to create, uh, you know, literally the first couple starship will probably have giant, you know, one of them might carry a bunch of, or maybe they'll split the payloads. Like each one has a large ISRU plant, which does uh, the Sabatier process to create methane on Mars, methane and oxygen on Mars. Each of them brings their own thing, you know, puts it down on the surface maybe or whatever, but then deploys a bunch of solar panels because it's going to take football field sized plus solar arrays to be able to power the generation, mm-hmm. you know, the, the fuel generators. So it's going to be an autonomous type of deployment, you know, land a couple of those first, make sure you have a propellant plant up and running. Yeah. And then maybe, you know, that'll maybe take a long time to, to even generate all that fuel. Literally a year plus, you yeah. know, which is okay because of the transit time anyway. But I mean, this is a logistics, crazy logistics. I, I, I still, yeah. I mean, we've put rovers and landers on there, but there's, I don't believe there's no intent of those things leaving there. Right. Right. Well, so, so that's like a harder, uh, I, I, that's actually of, be interesting. I mean, so right yeah. now, not curious, uh, Perseverance, which is on the way and landing in February, you know, um, we'll have a, it's doing some core samples and, and placing those in a, in a place with the intent of those being returned to earth. Actually, ESA mm. is working on plans to be able to land uh, close enough to be able to drive over to those samples and put them on a small rocket, actually, yeah. and send actual soil samples back to Earth. So, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Because it sounds like you might want Starship to orbit, to go into an orbit with Mars and, like, send people down there to start building stuff or something instead of, like, trying to land Starship on the surface. Like a smaller lander. Yeah. I, I don't know. It just, I mean, again, I'm, you know, I have a third grade understanding of all this, but, but it, <laughs> Just knowing how big Starship is already and how much create how much power it has, it seems a little bit like you might want to have a, a gentler touch for your first time. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's the whole Starship. I mean, Starship is crazy, and like it really. The more I hear Elon talk about it, and even the comp- people that work there, like the more I realize they are actually like they are actually designing Starship to work for Mars. Like that is part of the design process and kind of by solving that it makes so much stuff here like relatively easy you know like yes in order to get to mars to do this it makes earthbound stuff just a joke almost you know so th- if they solve this and they actually figure out how to routine r- routinely get to mars and and safely get to mars i mean kind of game over like everyone else is just trying to catch up wouldn't it be cool if they as a test uh launched a starship from the desert somewhere just not not like not on a launch pad just like out in the desert on some dirt i mean that's kind <laughs> of what they're doing in Boca Chica already i mean it's but i mean yeah, like no, no concrete like not actual yeah. like just literally out just, in a field just as a test for what would happen on mars basically yeah yeah well, don't forget Mars is 38% gravity, so it will always, you know, it's you can't really replicate that too well here. Sure, you know? sure, sure. sure. Um, cause it, but if it you can fire, do it here, you could do it there. Yeah. Right. And also they can use the vacuum optimized engines on Mars to take off. So there's a few things that they oh, okay. can't do, you know, here that they can do on Mars. Yeah, so it's, it's, not it's hard to, to simulate all of the conditions, you know, but man. <laughs> I'm curious. Uh, so, okay, we're we're watching this thing unfold in real time. Still haven't gotten the 15 kilometer hop, as as you know, there in <laughs> Iowa. Um, 
I don't know. I'm just kind of like trying to figure out, like, do you think that the next Mars window, they'll be able to, at the very least, just like shoot something out there? <laughs> I really hope On the starship? So. That's I mean, we're looking at 18 months or so, right? Uh, because we just so, had a window this year. Yeah, probably about twenty months for because it'd be twenty. It's every twenty six months, and I don't remember when Perseverance launched. Oh, okay. But was that you know, was, was that July? I think it was mid, like July seventeenth or yeah. something like that. So we're it's probably gonna be twenty twenty two. Yeah, it is. It's I think it's like August twenty twenty two is the opening of the window. Do you think by then <sighs> they will have it together to the point that they can send one out to Mars? I'm actually I'm gonna get a lot of poo poo for this. I think they can go orbital by then. Like mm-hmm. I think. There's a chance that they will have done and demonstrated an orbital mission with Starship by August 2022. And I really hope that doesn't totally age like milk. Um, <laughs> but the the thing to get to Mars, not only they, they can't just get to orbit, they have to get to orbit, have multiple freaking Starships and refuel it mm-hmm. to get to Mars. Like to have all of that figured out too. So not only because now, now think about the infrastructure you have to have for that too. Like, that's a whole. I, I would be shocked if they get something to Mars in the next Mars window. But me and I would still be quite pleasantly surprised if they actually have this all done in in four years to be able to do an orbital thing and and get people get the first uncrewed ones by twenty twenty four, prove it out, potentially put people in it in twenty twenty six or twenty twenty eight. You know, but that's still well, quite ambitious, really. When you, what I was are thinking we more see like first? just like a. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was say, what are we going to see first? The the uh, the the tower for Starliner or Starship on Mars? Sorry, say it again. The, Which one are we going to see first? The tower for Starliner or Starship on Mars? The tower, tower for Starliner. For Starliner. Is it Starliner, the one that is like ten billion dollars per step? Oh no, you always confuse Starliner and SLS. Naughty, oh, naughty, whatever. naughty. <laughs> Starliner, and isn't that the Starliner launch system? No. Space launch system. Starliner is <laughs> Starliner is just is Boeing riding on top uh, of a ULA um, Atlas V rocket. SLS right. is Orion, the Orion capsule. Turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm turning um, myself off. SLS, the tower is done for SLS. Oh, okay. The okay. first one. But if mm. they do make a block upgrade to SLS, they're gonna have to build another tower <laughs> for okay. several hundred million dollars. <laughs> All right, oh, was sorry. this the tower that was costing so much that if you stack that money up, it would get into space? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Literally. Oh, so, but, but, okay. So serial number eight, we're seeing teething pains. We're seeing, these are those things that I always tell people, you know, I, I'm going to be saying this on repeat each week now, but people have been pressuring me so much on Twitter. Like, Tim, the road is closing. Why aren't you getting down there? Get down there. You're, you're going to miss it. It's like, no, <laughs> I'm not going to miss this thing. And there's so many, I've, I've been watching this stuff for so, you know, since day one. Um, and it's, it's still, there's just so many unknown unknowns and I don't care who says what, I don't care when Elon Musk says we're going to do, he said they're going to test hop the freaking super heavy booster in October. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's November <laughs> and they've barely stacked anything for the super heavy booster. But they're starting to, that's he great. Said, but like He said there would be a Tesla driving from LA to New York unassisted in 2016, was it? Nah, 2017 That's when, or 18. Oh, 2017. Okay, yeah. The first the first self-driving video came out in 2016. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, things I take mean, time, people, and, despite what other people ask or want them to be, right? Yeah. And of course, you guys know that if you're listening to this podcast, you know, we all love Elon's work and we love Elon, but we all have been around long enough to understand Elon time. <laughs> Elon time is a thing because he I think he's just sitting there. He's seeing the potential and seeing like, oh, we are working on this. We're working on this. We're working on this. We have all the stuff ready. It's probably going to happen in three weeks. And people are like three years, you mean? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can tell you from being a guy sitting on the other side of a lot of CEOs when the CEOs are asking for stuff. This is so common. Oh, you know, sure. it's always like, you know, like I'll be presenting something my teams are working on or whatever, like, oh, blah, blah, blah. You know, yeah, we can do this. We can do this. Here's the plan on this. They're like, oh, yeah, that all sounds great. So like next week, you think we get I'm like, what? <laughs> think we can implement no. this next week? Next, <laughs> next quarter. Let's have it's an update. Like, <laughs> it's, just, it's just a single banana. How much does that cost? $10? <laughs> right. I don't know if you guys know that from Arrested Development. Arrested Development, yeah. Yeah. Like, I feel like that's the, they don't quite understand, you know, they're, they're looking at such big picture stuff. They're not always... Seeing all the yeah. little tiny details in every little subsystem, you know. I mean, Elon does work with that stuff daily, so he is 
deeply entrenched and involved in that. But I think he's so optimistic about everything going right. He just never considers that things don't always go right, especially well, he, when you're working I so feverishly addresses, on things. He addressed this before, right? And he kind of said that that's, that's part of his role as he sees it is to try to be aggressive on timelines and that will kind of light a fire under people to try to meet those deadlines. Yeah. And, you know, because if, he, if he's saying it'll take us a year and, you know, originally, if he said it takes us five years, the team's like, sweet, going to play golf today, <laughs> right. you know. But if they're like a year, you're like, crap, I better get this done. Like, I got to yeah. go. It's true. There's something to that. Yeah, I mean, I think we all do that a little bit, you know, when you have that pressure of like, I have to get this done before this. You work your butt off, you know. I've actually works. been, um, I've adjusted my uh, productivity strategy, I guess Skillshare. to say, um, right? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, what I realized was that, like, if I just, if it's like I need to finish the script today, then I'll be working on it until you know two in the morning. But but what I've started doing is just giving myself an hour, and not that I'll finish the script necessarily, but it's like. Um, I just give myself an hour and it's like, you have an hour to work on this, get as much of it done as you can. And Mm -hmm. the productivity just goes through the roof because I don't, I don't give myself the rest of the day to do it. I just have this little bit of time and Mm -hmm. it's like gamifying it. How much of this can I get done? Can I get through this section before, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. There's a whole thing, the the Pomodoro technique. Have you heard of that? It's kind of the, the same, yeah, yeah. The tomato timer. Oh, it's mm-hmm. like 25, 15 or something. You never heard of the See? See, okay. Tim's not working in corporate to, America. I have to just regurgitate real quick what I just heard. I heard a bunch. Have you ever heard of the Panuno Zoomer? It's the 2012, 13, 15. You just got to zip zap. I mean, just splanderize it. Like, whatever you just said was Oh, complete. splanderizing is the, is the way. <laughs> like, have you tried the... Well, uh, see, and and now you know how how it feels when I'm watching one of your videos. <laughs> Mike was a the tomato the turn is... tables. So <laughs> so tomato dash timer dot com. Shout out to them. I've used them for so many years. Uh, it's this idea of the yeah, Pomodoro technique. So it's like t- you you work intensely for 25 minutes, singular task focused. Don't do anything else. This isn't multitasking. You turn off your phone. You get rid of distractions, et cetera. Uh, and then you take a break, and then you do it again. I forget how many times you do it, like three times, and then you go on for a longer break. And and in the end, the idea is that after uh, an hour or so, you, you've actually had a good amount of breaks, but you've, done, you've been more productive than had mm-hmm. you just set aside a, a full block of time because... The idea is that our brains can't actually dedicate that much time and attention to one thing. So yeah. So what what I do if especially if I'm having like a really bad writer's block or something is I do that, but I do like ten and two. So like work for ten minutes and then take a break for two minutes. Mm-hmm. And you can do anything for ten minutes, you know. And if I'm really really stuck and I just can't like find the words or anything, I literally will just like start typing anything just you know <laughs> stream of consciousness whatever's in my head i will type about how i can't think of anything to type and but i mean like just getting the fingers going and getting that mm-hmm. sort of activation and then in the neurons and stuff it just kind of leads to one thing and then after maybe two or three of those sets i'm in flow state and then i can't turn it off and it's like i just i'm just going 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 and i don't want to take breaks anymore and of course yeah. at first it's like pulling teeth and i just want to kill myself but the analogy yeah. i have is it's like scuba diving a lot of times a lot of this like scripting or more critical thinking like deeper work it's like it takes you a little bit of time to get down to the bottom to actually do your scuba diving and then once you're there you're super productive Mm-hmm. This is why working at home with your spouse is really difficult because then they want to, <laughs> hey, did you do this? And they just like ripped you out of the ocean right there. You're like, mm-hmm. ah, now I have to go deep dive all the way down, you know? So, mm. yeah. yeah. So I guess uh, productivity that a, tip of the day. <laughs> what are you guys being productive on this week? <sighs> do I go first? Who wants to go first? Do it. do it, Joe. Do it. I have to look up. What, what is the one I worked on? Um <laughs> Oh, I, I, the video. Yeah. So Monday's video is about um, where Earth's water came from. Like, oh. where did all this water come from? Uh, the the Costco. theory for the longest time was the late heavy bombardment that it came on uh, in from comets. Uh, but one of the big problems with that is that the um, hydrogen to deuterium ratio, deuterium is the basically heavy hydrogen. It's got an extra neur- neutron, <laughs> neuron, extra neutron in there. Um, but the, the ratio 
that we see on comets now that we've studied them and gone up and you know taken them. samples and stuff uh, it's different from what we have here on earth so it's thought that it actually came from a different mechanism which is basically it kind of was squozen out of the very rocks that created the earth in the first place hmm. uh, and it kind oh. of requires you to rethink exactly what water is because we have we actually have a very narrow definition of water as something that we bathe in and we drink and can freeze and whatnot but there's actually uh it's almost uh it's almost like i compare it to the visual like uh the visible light on the electromagnetic spectrum like what we think of as light is actually mm. a very narrow part of this whole thing and water is kind of the same way hmm. so that's awesome nice yeah. it's actually pretty interesting Sweet. Next week, I have a video about how Tesla can 1,000x their growth. And it relates to Elon's trick. announcement not too long ago that they are going to start licensing their software, I'm sorry, their hardware and everything else out to other companies. Because, mm -hmm. which is, not, you know, he's said before, we've always open sourced it, but like it didn't really mean much. It was more like, hey, no, 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 I just want you to build it for me and I'll just pay you. <laughs> Um, and he, he tweeted, he had a, a tweet thread about that like a month or so ago. And so I, I dive into what that could actually mean for their, you know, how it would go. So there you have cool. it. Um, I, I'm working on, so tonight, uh, just, just so we can cut it up in the post process, uh, have you guys listening to this rocket lab successfully caught, uh, or had a booster splash down under a parachute on their, on their launch. Okay, here's option two. Rocket Lab uh, tried to, uh, you know, <laughs> cover under a parachute, but it didn't quite work. So, shoot. Uh, but, yeah, we're going to be finding out here tonight. So, those of you listening on oh, Friday when this comes cool. out. Yeah. Um, we Rocket should hopefully Lab have seen fails that. to successfully gotta, splash on. Oh. So, so, I'm excited about that. Now, the tricky thing is, and, and I, I want your guys' opinion on this real quick. So, um, and I've been thinking about this quite a bit. So Rocket Lab is actually, they have a, a sponsor that's donating $1 to a children's hospital for every viewer that watches their stream. So it brings up a, a debate. If I stream, am I taking away viewers potentially from Rocket Lab? Or the question is, can I make tell multiple times on air, hey, if you are watching me, you need to have the Rocket Lab stream pulled up. If you can only watch one, please mm. watch theirs. I think the net benefit of me streaming to a larger potential audience, if you look at like their views versus my views on covering their own launches, it tends to be about double. Um, my net benefit could be increasing their, you know, yeah, address, you know, sending more people to them than would otherwise if I didn't stream. Do you, so you're just that, telling people to pull it up on a separate tab. On a separate tab. If they can't watch two at a time, then only watch Rocket Lab. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Does that uh, do? You, does that lot is that logical or is that being? Because I'm actually debated. Like, obviously, I could not stream, but I think no, that actually no, would be but worse. Look, no, if if they if that if that whoever's donating the money wants to do that and just have the biggest whatever, then tell them to also do it for your channel. If you know you're the one getting double their views, don't no, feel bad no, about no. that at all. I think I think you're totally fine in in doing it how you what your audience expects, right? Which is for you to stream it. So. Well, the, yeah, the, the big takeaway is, I guess, would they, would I, by me streaming to a larger audience, potentially increase the viewership that would have otherwise, you know, For would sure. their viewership be mm -hmm. higher if I point more people to them? Or if For I'm sure. not streaming at all, would there be people that would then just watch the, like, we don't know because I almost always, actually, there is a Rocket Lab launch that I recently didn't stream. I should compare yeah. and see if there's a uptick already when I don't stream. It's the Schrodinger's cat of streaming. <laughs> yeah, but I'll, I'll say I multiple times. From, I, I think I'll just say multiple times on air, like, please just, you know, if you're watching this, you need to also be watching this. If you can't watch that, then I think that's the best way to do it. And there, were, hopefully that way we can increase their viewership. But um, meanwhile, I, f I was so excited last week. Um, I started getting back, you know, after I did the the whole thing or whatever with uh, the Starship versus Falcon 9 video. I got back into my script, taking in all the stuff that I got back for the Soviet engine video, you know. Got a little bit of stuff, like Scott mainly pointed out a few things, and that led me down this new rabbit hole. And I connected, so I actually have a family tree now because I he helped point out a, a rocket that I kind of forgot about or like didn't realize tied 
two families together of the rocket engines. And like, there's now all of a sudden so much more, like literally there's two engines now that have like three strong ties in the family tree of the Mm. Soviet rocket engine because I went down that extra rabbit hole. And that made me like, I was literally like giddy as I'm typing. I'm like, yes, (gasps) cool. (laughs) I'm like so excited. And I found this paper that uh, I hadn't found before that really tied together a lot of things. And I was like, this is awesome. So I'm really excited because now I, and now I'm tying up. That did make me realize also I need to kind of go back to the very beginning and add a little bit more history context from the V2 rocket. The Nazi mm. rocket was kind of the grandfather of all modern rocketry, liquid fueled rockets. Uh, kind of start there and and do a little more of a section about that, how we got from that engine into the Soviets' designs. And then that leads into the whole thing. So it's going to be, this is going to be the craziest, like this will be an hour 15, hour 30. I don't know. It's going to be a full blown I might even shoot it differently. I might make it into a documentary at this point. Hmm. Because why no, not? I would. I mean, it's uh, the the uh, the the Russian rocket history is pretty substantial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I keep you keep saying this. I'm like, this needs to be like History Channel or something. This needs to be like we need, we need like some David Attenborough in here. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Or some Werner Herzog. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. I think uh, hopefully it turns out well. I don't know. I wish, I really wish travel was unrestricted or like less restricted. It wasn't a crazy thing because I would ab- this would be a video that I would love to just go to, to Russia and shoot some of it, you know, in Russia and all that stuff. And, but oh well. as winter approaches, probably not <laughs> the best time to be trying to do that. Did you yeah. learn nothing from Napoleon? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, guys, uh, that's it for us. We'll yeah. see you guys in our our ludicrous future. Hey, guys! Thanks so much for watching and for listening. We really do appreciate it. We couldn't do it without you. Yeah, and if you want more of us, you can consider becoming a Patreon member where you can get early access to episodes, you can listen to us record live, join our awesome Discord community, or get your name in the show credits. So head over to olfpod.com slash Patreon to learn more. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.